I'm quite overwhelmed by the introduction. And may I say first, thank you very much, Noel, for the honor that you've bestowed on me. Noel remarks that I did him a favor in writing an introduction to his book. I'm sure that I'm probably the only faculty member in this room who had a first year student come with a book length manuscript about to be published and invited, and invited the professor to write an introduction to it. It's a tribute to Noel and not to me. Jose, thank you very much for the generous remarks. I think they were excessive. They've set a very high standard. I'll do my best to live up to it in front of this very critical audience. The issue, ladies and gentlemen, is quite important and quite anguishing. The notion of humanitarian intervention is something that is very much in the news at the moment. What I mean by humanitarian intervention is an intervention for humanitarian purposes by military means undertaken by one state or a group of states in the territory of another state. None of us would now question the right of a state to impose severe economic sanctions against the state that is engaged in serious human rights violations. And so you may ask quite reasonably, what's wrong with proceeding to a military exercise if the economic sanctions fail to stop the genocide or other massive violation of human rights? And the answer to that very reasonable question is, it's very complicated and not simple. And I'd like to explain to you why. For one thing, states have long meddled in the affairs of other states. It's the essence of international politics. There is no such thing as the international arena. There are only other states. The meddling in some time has been conducted by virtually every mode of statecraft, from the most coercive to the most persuasive. And the meddling has, in some cases, been motivated by economic interest, in some cases by tribal zeal, religious zeal, in some cases simply the lust for power. Uh, sometimes the meddlers have succeeded in bringing about a change in the government of their target, what we now call regime change. In earlier periods, International law was entirely agnostic about this type of meddling. Governments felt no compulsion to dignify them with legalistic euphemisms. So when President Theodore Roosevelt asked his attorney general, Philander Knox, whether a legal argument ought to be cooked up to justify America's management of the secession of Colum from Colombia of the isthmus that became the Republic of Panama, Attorney General Knox responded, Oh, Mr. President, do not let so great an achievement suffer from any taint of legality. <laughs> Nowadays, Roosevelt's successors may be using many of the same techniques he and his predecessors deployed, but two fundamental and not always reciprocally compatible international legal policies serve as criteria for determining whether such actions are lawful. One policy affirms the maintenance of the autonomy of individual states and their protection from outside interference by other states. Call it the sovereignty principle or policy. The other policy affirms the protection of the minimum rights of the inhabitants within states. Let's call it the human rights policy. Now, both policies are set out in the Charter of the United Nations, but when the Charter was drafted in 1945, its text tilted in favor of the state autonomy, the sovereignty principle. Human rights were mentioned briefly, but in the most general terms. And just in case anyone got the wrong idea, the Charter established expressly that its writ would not run to what it called matters of domestic concern, matters of domestic jurisdiction or concern, which most governments assumed meant how they treated their own citizens. And as for taking up arms to stop gross violations of human rights, the Charter prohibited its members from any use of force other than for the limited purpose of self-defense unless there was an express authorization by the Security Council. Although traces of humanitarian intervention can be found in the writings of some of the founding fathers of international law, 
The concept was used in a context in which war was lawful. Hugo Grotius and company were referring to circumstances in which natural law analysis of a humanitarian matter led to the conclusion that force should be exercised. By contrast, the United Nations Charter was prohibiting all uses of force unless authorized by the Security Council. No surprise then that after 1945, most international legal scholars asserted that humanitarian intervention was precluded. Indeed, they viewed it as a pernicious concept for if accepted, they assumed, it would serve as a fig leaf for all sorts of interventions and undermine the sovereignty policy, which they deemed, quite correctly, to be one of the major achievements of contemporary international law. But if many of the practices of international politics and international law persist, other parts have changed. The most dramatic change has been the emergence of an international human rights administration replete with elaborated codes of fundamental human rights as well as institutional in arrangements for their implementation. More and more countries have become effective democracies and their value systems embrace human rights. The media, and latterly the electronic media, present vast amounts of information about events on the planet. That in turn has enabled greater and greater popular participation in domestic and in international politics. Gross violations of human rights are now being brought in the most graphic detail into the living rooms of the citizens of de democratic states on a regular basis. Non-governmental organizations committed to the protection of human rights can quickly mobilize to press their governments and their publics for meaningful remedies in the face of grave violations. The relation between the policies favoring state autonomy on the one hand and those favoring the protection of human rights and the inhabitants of those states on the other thus have begun to tilt in favor of human rights. In 1999, then Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, took note of the change. State sovereignty in its most basic sense is being redefined, he said. States are now widely understood to be instruments of service of their peoples and not vice versa. If the international legal principles about massive human rights violations within a state were becoming clearer, the question of what to do about them, and more specifically, who may do it, remained cloudy. As I mentioned, the United Nations Charter prescribes that except for immediate self-defense against an armed attack from abroad, the only body empowered to use force or author authorize others to use it for any other purpose is the Security Council. When the Council takes up its international security function, it's an important one, and its writ even runs to the otherwise insulated matters of domestic jurisdiction. But each of the Council's five permanent members is endowed with a veto. That means that any one of them can stop an initiative by the Council to use force for the protection of human rights. Many members of the international community underwent a crisis of conscience after the appalling inaction of the United Nations as the genocide of 800,000 Tutsi in Rwanda ran its course in 1994. Kofi Annan, who had been in charge of peacekeeping at the time and felt some personal responsibility for the debacle, convened a high-level panel to address the question of how to deal with massive violations of human rights within states. We endorse, the panel proclaimed, the emerging norm that there is a collective international responsibility to protect, exercisable by the Security Council, authorizing military intervention as a last resort in the event of genocide and other large-scale ki killing, ethnic cleansing, or serious violation of international humanitarian law which sovereign governments have proved powerless or unwilling to prevent. The international human rights movement promptly cheered the introduction of the notion of what came to be called R2P. But ladies and gentlemen, there was actually less there than met the eye. For one thing, the high-level panel declared that R2P was an emerging norm, even though the competence it purported to assign to the Security Council was already in the United Nations Charter. So the panel was actually dialing back a full-blown legal competence to an emerging status. But the key problem with R2P 
was that its implementation was once again being assigned exclusively to the Security Council. Now, that's fine when the five members agree, but in many cases, no matter how massive the human rights violations, they were unlikely to. For one thing, not all of the permanent members are committed to the international human rights program. Even those that express some verbal support for the program resist the proposition that international law should be judging the ways governments exercise their power internally. And the political consequences of any prospective decision are an ever-present consideration in international decision making. An intervention by the Security Council or one authorized by it may have the effect of changing the political alignment of the targeted state within the world power process to the detriment of one of the Council's permanent members. Consider the Syrian crisis. The Soviet Union and then Russia have long viewed the Assad dynasty as a client, one which moreover provides it with a naval base, small as it is at Tartus. The base may be dispensable, but abandoning al-Assad would send a message to other Russian protégés that Moscow cannot be relied on. No surprise then that Russia has blocked any Security Council authorization of humanitarian action that might have weakened or hastened the fall of the Assad government. And though a comparison between the events in Syria and Bahrain would be invidious, one must note that the United States, with a naval base at Manama, has dragged its feet about ostensibly humanitarian council action in the Bahrain imbroglio. Now, the council's record is not entirely a chronicle of inaction. It has proved itself capable of acting to authorize types of humanitarian intervention in circumstances in which the probable consequence of the military action does not appear to change power arrangements within international politics. Thus, for example, the Council was able to agree to authorize action on the Ivory Coast when an election, which international observers declared to be free and fair, was rejected by the loser who sought to use the army to maintain power. And in, 19, in Resolution 1973, of course, the Council authorized all necessary means for protecting the civilian population in Libya. That particular resolution was interpreted by NATO in ways beyond what Russia and China thought they had voted for, and neither is likely to be fooled again. Although R2P uses the language of humanitarianism, it does not authorize humanitarian intervention. It reserves all action for the Security Council. That is its flaw. But that's not the end of the story. International law as a general matter allows states to act in some circumstances. Boutros Ghali, a former Secretary General, said one of the achievements of the Charter of the United Nations was to empower the organization to take enforcement action against those responsible for threats to the peace breaches of the peace or acts of aggression, end quote. Boutros Ghali acknowledged that, quote, neither the Security Council nor the Secretary General at present has the capacity to deploy, direct, command, and control operations for the purposes uh, except on a very limited scale. And after reviewing the modalities available to the UN, he conceded, the United Nations does not have or claim a monopoly of any of these instruments. All can be, and most of them have been employed by regional organizations, by ad hoc groups of states, or by individual states. To be sure, the legal authority for such action lacks the clarity of the lex scripta of the charter. But all that means is that the lawfulness of such actions is affected by the features of each case. Now, Boutros Ghali's observation is particularly pertinent to humanitarian intervention. If human rights policy has reached parity with or even exceeded the sovereign policy, yet the only international institution which R2P authorized is unable to respond to a massive violation, should other actors be contingently empowered by international law to act unilaterally? Professor Albrecht Brandelshofer captured the absurdity of a negative answer. He said, it becomes more and more intolerable 
to see grave violations of human rights within a state and see other states being banned by public international law from intervening. And indeed, within recent memory, there have been a fair number of unauthorized military interventions by states ostensibly for human rights purposes, and some of them seem to have been viewed as lawful. In 1979, for example, Tanzania invaded Uganda and replaced the government of the tyrant Idi Amin with a government led by a former elected president. In the same year, France invaded the Central African Republic, then the Central African Empire, imprisoned the dictator, Bokassa, and put in a former president of the country. In the same year, Vietnam invaded Cambodia and expelled the genocidal Khmer Rouge government from the capital and placed Hun Sen in power. And in that same year, the then Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, overthrew and killed the president, Hafizullah Amin, and placed a different president in power. Only the lawfulness of the Soviet invasion was repeatedly challenged by the General Assembly of the United Nations. All the other interventions have been viewed as lawful. When the Slobodan Milosevic government in Serbia suppressed Kosovar efforts to secure greater autonomy, and human rights within the province by what was believed to be mass murder, NATO in 1999 and without Security Council authorization conducted a long aerial bombardment of Serbia. Serbia yielded and the United Nations and the European Union supervised Kosovo until it emerged to independence. The Security Council had plainly not authorized the bombardment yet most European governments and most international legal scholars viewed it as the right thing to do. Even Kofi Annan, by this time Secretary General of the UN and the custodian of the Charter, did. It was tragic, he said, but there are times when the use of force may be legitimate in the pursuit of peace. And two days later, recalling UN inaction in Rwanda, he said, I want to read this very carefully, to those for whom the greatest threat to the future of international order is the use of force in the absence of a Security Council mandate, one might ask, not in the context of Kosovo, but in the context of Rwanda, if in those dark days and hours leading up to the genocide, a coalition of states had been prepared to act in defense of the Tutsi population, but did not receive prompt council authorization, should such a coalition have stood aside and allowed the horror to unfold? Not everyone will agree with Anand's implied answer to his rhetorical question. Certainly Russia and China do not. But enough of us do so that in the second decade of the 21st century, the practical question for citizens of the world concerned about human rights and the leaders of their government is no longer whether humanitarian intervention, unilateral military intervention, is absolutely prohibited. When the Security Council is unable to operate and the violations are sufficiently massive, unilateral actions for humanitarian purposes, while always controversial, may in the circumstances be lawful. But that hardly resolves the issue. It only advances it from one of law to one of prudential and political <coughs> consideration. Under what circumstances should humanitarian interventions be undertaken, and how should they be conducted? There are three distinct types of situations in which some form of humanitarian intervention may be relevant. In one, massive human rights violations are occurring, and the legal government, which is not responsible for them, is unable to arrest and reestablish order. In a second type of situation, massive human rights are occurring. They're either being committed by the government or if ostensibly by private agents with the government's acquiescence. In a third type of situation, massive violations are a consequence of a civil war between two factions struggling for power within a state. And both sides are committing massive human rights violations as they struggle for power. Three situations. From an international legal standpoint, the first of the situations is the simplest. The humanitarian intervention, even when it is conducted without the permission of the local government, is not aimed at forcibly replacing it. 
the permanent members of the council are more likely to authorize such an intervention, and even if they don't, they are less likely to object to the intervention if it's of short duration and aimed only at arresting human rights violations, as long as it doesn't bring about an internal or external political realignment. By contrast, the second and third types of situations are more likely to provoke international resistance, especially if the humanitarian action is, in effect, an externally induced regime change, which leads to an international realignment of that state. In particular, the third type, civil war, is in danger of becoming an international war if the permanent members of the council or regional powers are not in agreement. Interventions in the second and third situations also confront the intervening force with the prospect of longer term responsibilities. Displacing the existing government, as bad as it may be, can leave a vacuum that will require an alternative be put into place. It may need to be sustained for an extended time. Humanitarian intervention in these circumstances is likely to be of a longer duration and inevitably to take on some of the character of an occupation. Interventions in the second and third situations which involve regime change present challenges that are not found in humanitarian interventions of the first type. Those challenges will be exacerbated if there is no consensus in the Security Council. One challenge is determining the political comp composition of the replacement regime. It's easy to conclude that a, the prior regime was human rights abusive. It's difficult and in a world of many political cultures, arrogant to determine what sort of workable system should replace it when there is no natural leader or indigenous agreement. But once a regime has been expelled and the territory of the state is controlled by the intervener, it cannot simply say humanitarian mission accomplished and fly off. It must supervise a transformation if only to allow for its own orderly exit. Its preferred model of political organization may not fit the local political culture or cultures and cannot ignore persistent forces of nationalism, tribalism, religion, language, and other powerful and manipulable focuses of identity. The great human rights instruments, of course, do prescribe an international standard of governance. In practice, however, the standard is expressed in high-level principles and general norms and the margin of appreciation and the tempo of implementation are all very elastic. And truth to tell, the International Code of Human Rights, while universalizable in the sense that it can be applied to everyone without reference to gender, race, ethnicity, or religion, is not universally accepted. In theory, the determination of a replacement system can be passed through to the people by means of a plebiscite as it's supposed to be the most reliable method of testing what a group wants. But elections presuppose a minimum of international and external agreement about what the elections are to decide, an electorate that is informed as to the actual options, and a willingness by all sides to abide by the results. International observers may supply the mechanics of election, but not the many political and cultural factors that make them free and fair and binding in a meaningful sense. As for governments of national unity, one of the exit cards in humanitarian interventions, they really involve dividing the spoils among the strong and not necessarily among the deserving or virtuous. They give the appearance of a self-sustaining order, but may change nothing in the structure of a regime that had proved itself to be pathogenic. Another major challenge is the cost in life and treasure of conducting a humanitarian intervention. The United States, which has the greatest military force, is frequently called upon in situations of massive human rights violations to engage in, or at least as in Libya, to logistically support humanitarian intervention, especially those involving a regime change. But its actual capacity is limited. For all its global interests and responsibilities, if all or most of them or suddenly re require external action would exhaust and leave the United States unable to pursue them. So humanitarian interventions involving regime change are by their nature unexpected calls on military assets, calls whose actual costs are difficult to engage in advance. 
The process of regime change may also put great strain on the economic resources of the changer and its national economy. Finally, the assumption that a humanitarian intervention that has had to change a regime can simply cut out a few bad apple leaders as a surgeon would resect a tumor overlooks the fact that there are always social formations, tribes, and ethnicities that benefited from the old regime and will fight to protect it and to protect themselves from national or international trial and punishment, if not summary execution at home. The modus operandi of contemporary popular resistance is likely to drain the regime changer and frustrate its good intentions, leading to greater and greater violence, more and more alienation of the local population, and ever stronger resistance to the putative regime changer. I think we can all think of some recent examples in which the United States encountered this phenomenon. <coughs> These are only some of the reasons for thinking hard before undertaking any elective military activity in the 21st century, all the more so when the International Criminal Court is in the wings and poised to exercise its jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. And although actions motivated by humanitarian concern always seem unassailably virtuous compared to other interventions, the reasons counseling caution apply with full force to unilateral humanitarian intervention, especially those which by their nature are in fact regime changes. And yet, there are, to quote Kofi Annan again, those dark days and hours Circumstances in which the evil presented is enormous. The human costs of inaction are massive, yet the Security Council is unable to muster the unanimity necessary for it to act. Then, the only possible remedy is a unilateral humanitarian intervention by a single state or a coalition of states. Let me suggest 11 guidelines, and I speak now as a citizen, less as a lawyer, 11 guidelines which the leaders of the United States, the ultimate actor in international politics for this type of enterprise, should weigh before deciding to undertake unilateral humanitarian intervention, even in those dark days and hours. First, as much international organizational support should be gained as possible. The obstacles to Security Council approval are well known. But even a resolution by the General Assembly under the Uniting for Peace resolution may provide a measure of meaningful international support. Regional organizational support for humanitarian action proved to be an important political variable in the Libyan transition. But there are limits to the practical effect of such symbols. When the United States intervened in Grenada in 1983, the endorsement by the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States did not legitimate the action. The UN General Assembly still condemned the action as, quote, a flagrant violation of international law. Second, if a humanitarian intervention, especially one involving regime change, is not formally authorized by the United Nations, there should be significant foreign support among the elite states of the world, especially in the states contributing forces for the change. Third, there should be significant internal support for the regime change in both the would-be changer and the targeted state. The individual or elite group that is the target of regime change should ideally not have a popular base of support. Fourth, an acceptable alternative transition government should be readily available, one that promises to be democratic and effective so that ideally all that would be involved is regime change and not regime reconstruction or nation building. Fifth, act sooner rather than later. In a BBC interview given on September 11th, this past September 11th, Major General Robert Mood, the former commander of the UN force in Syria, now, now withdrawn, drew attention to acting at the propitious moment. Are there any circumstances, the interviewer asked, in which you could see the outside intervention might help bring the conflict to an end? General Mood replied, absolutely. Outside intervention might indeed help the problem if an intervention should have happened much earlier and would then, but, and would then have had to be of such a scale that it's impossible because it's totally unrealistic to talk about 
mustering international support from the key players. Six, the occupation by an outside force should be short. Seventh, the costs to the outside force should be manageable, if not minimal. Eighth, the force accomplishing the humanitarian intervention should not be believed by those within the country or outside it to have a parochial interest in securing the change. Ninth, where nation building is an inevitable part of humanitarian intervention involving a regime change, the United Nations should be responsible or prominently involved, as in Namibia, East Timor, and Kosovo. The UN commitment should ideally be secured before the regime change. In the absence of United Nations involvement, regional organizational support for the political reconstruction should be secured. Tenth, in the circumstances in which none of these conditions are met, it's best to, reply on, to, reply, to rely on covert action or non-military strategies if they promise some amelioration. And 11th, above all, Hippocrates counseled, do no harm. Where external efforts will only cause graver human rights violations, don't intervene. Let me return to General Mood's interview on September 11th. When asked whether other countries should be getting involved with the Syrian opposition, with attention drawn to French funding of revolutionary councils, Mood, whose intervention, whose United Nations intervention had failed, replied, quote, anyone feeding the violence with money or weapons should consider very carefully whether this brings us closer or further away from less violence and more dialogue. Unfortunately, if we create expectations about outside intervention that will not meet the international community, may actually prolong the terrible suffering for the Syrian people. That sounds garbled. I'm not misreading it. This is a transcription of an interview. And if you listen to it on BBC, the prosody makes sense. But the transcription, as is often the case for anyone reading transcripts, is not the same. So as cruel as it seems, there are circumstances in which unilateral action will only exacerbate the human rights situation. And paradoxically, the proper course from a human rights perspective may be to refrain from acting. The contrasting treatment of the international response to the massive human rights violations in Libya and Syria, very different treatments, indicates if an indicator were ever needed that humanitarian intervention will continue to be normatively ambiguous in international law. The apparent consensus on R2P in cases of massive human rights violations is at best neutral on unilateral hum humanitarian intervention and actually, I believe, against it. The Security Council, R2P's exclusive agent, can only act with the agreement of all member permanent members. In those cases in which the interests of one permanent member would be affected by council action, that member will block it by its veto or force an anodyne resolution that fails to accomplish anything. Unilateral action, whether military or economic, will still be demanded by parts of the international community, yet viewed as unlawful by others. But even among potential supporters, the willingness to resort to unilateral action will turn on the availability of national military and non-military resources, internal support, and geostrategic interest. In many cases, the absence of these factors will mean a decision to engage in symbolic deeds, but to abstain from really meaningful action. Once an innovative international arrangement is put into place, it becomes a variable which anyone can use to use to game the system. This has happened to the recent elevation of R2P and humanitarian intervention, as ambiguous as they are in international consciousness. Manoj Arsanjani in the American Journal of International Law asked recently, quote, how to contain R2P from becoming a strategic tool abused by outsiders as well as by a domestic opposition that adopts a tactic of provoking a level of violence high enough for the invocation of R2P and external intervention in its favor. With its gradual legitimization, agitators seeking regime change within a state have come to appreciate that if they can create a human rights focus of sufficient notoriety, 
They may mobilize parts of the international human rights community, ostensibly for the protection of human rights, when in fact they are seeking outside assistance to change their government. With the continuing uncertainty as to the implementability of R2P and efforts to game it, the normative force of both international human rights and their unilateral implementation will continue to be uncertain. The result of that uncertainty will, will mean that each subsequent application, rather than reinforcing the opinio juris of the law and its implementation, will remain controversial. Decision makers will face grave choices, often without the certainty that a decision to act for the humanitarian purpose will accomplish a humanitarian end. Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, said, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang off the glay and leave us naught but grief and pain. And I think that that's some good advice for those contemplating the humanitarian interventions of regime change magnitude. I think here that when it comes to military intervention of any sort, humility rather than romantic hubris is advised. Thank you very much. Professor Reisman has agreed to take some questions, and there are mics set up here, so please step up and I'm sure you've provoked quite a few questions. I'm not surprised. The question is whether different countries in Europe, Europe take, different, uh, take a different approach to this. Yes, they do. In part, in some cases for internal political reasons, in some cases because of historical concerns. The, the motives that enter into the uh, decisions about participating in these types of interventions vary. Germany, laboring under a historic burden of its guilt for precipitating the Second World War, has a population that is averse to any type of intervention, even if there are serious human rights violations. Other states don't have that particular incubus and are, are more prepared, more inclined to engage in this. Very few European states actually have the means for engaging in an effective humanitarian intervention. So in virtually every case, it will be conducted, if there is support for it, through NATO, and the burden will effectively be carried by the major member of NATO, the United States. Uh, hi, Michael. Uh, sorry for coming in late. I'm not so late that I don't want to, uh, uh, to raise a, um, a question um, about uh, the frame of analysis that, that you've offered, particularly in a prescriptive part of your talk, which I did manage to, um, to hear. So we know that all historical action takes place under uh, uncertainty. is that you see all of the, uh, the downsides and the risks uh, of acting. But of course, when we look at the historical background and how this movement emerged and became stronger, we have to look at the Balkans, where, where you know, there, you know, initially there was a tremendous sense, I think, of, of guilt about not acting for a long period of time and then having uh, a genocide in Europe. So it seems to me that the ultimate question uh, juridical normative 
can't be resolved by saying that things could go wrong. Historically, things have gone wrong. Historically, sometimes things have gone well. Uh, and then uh, also, we don't know the time horizon. I mean, Hegel says the owl of Minerva only rises when the sun sets. So we, we may think that there are certain aspects that are really disastrous and regrettable, for example, if they're wrong. And I would agree with that. But in what horizon do we, do, do we tell whether we advance the march of history in the, um, uh, in the Middle East uh, by intervening, or, 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 or set it back, or, or advanced it, but at a, a, you know, intolerable human cost. Ultimately, we're, we're pushed back to Weber's politics of responsibility, and those who, and pushed back on our values. And, and here I think that the values of the human rights uh, movement uh, often will tip the balance in favor of doing something rather than having blood on one's hands by doing nothing. Thank you for the question, Rob. The, the brief answer, I hope you're not leaving. No, I'm leaving now. <laughs> I'm hoping there will be more questions. The, uh, the, the brief answer is you did the best you can. And, there, and I ticked off a number of humanitarian interventions that proved to be successful. I think we can also think of some interventions that had humanitarian impulses that proved to be very unsuccessful. You do the best you can. I'm interested in identifying the factors that I think in, will, in particular cases, militate against a successful outcome. And that seems to me to be prudent, but not a denial of humanitarian intervention. As for moral responsibility, I'm not a moral philosopher, so I don't preach how other people should behave. But in my own moral calculus, I feel no moral obligation to do that which can't be done. And I don't grieve over it. Well, I, what I pointed out were the factors that should be brought into to bear. And it seems to me that, I, I presume you would not argue with this, that in circumstances in which everything augurs for failure or worse, one doesn't act. There are circumstances, for example, in which an intervention could lead to a an international war. And that would seem to me to indicate to the, as a matter of legal prudence, if not moral responsibility, that one refrain. Uh, thank you for the question. As usual, very pertinent. Hi, uh, thank you for your remarks. Uh, I was really interested by one of your uh, conditions, the fourth one. And uh, please correct me if I'm interpreting this wrong, but uh, in the case of Syria, uh, I would think that that would mean that that condition might not be satisfied because of some of the uh, fractures uh, in the Syrian opposition that have been brought to light. Uh, and my question is, where does that leave us in terms of options uh, for a uh, unilateral uh, intervention or some type of assistance? Uh, if that's not satisfied, is a covert type of option or is there another option on the table uh, when we're worried about uh, what might happen uh, in the vacuum that exists after the overthrow of Assad? Uh, and also factoring in, sorry, uh, without the ability to intervene, uh, the impending problems uh, created by uh, Assad's uh, air power, fixed wing aircraft, um, threats on the people. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I have scrupulously avoided making statements about Syria because, in, in candor, I, I don't know all the facts. I have the impression that there is ongoing intervention by many different parties, not all of whom share the same interest in, uh, in vari through various modalities. I, I'm certain that unmentionable agencies from a number of different states are, are deeply involved. Some of, their, some of them on one side of what is effectively a civil war, others on the other side of what is effectively a civil war. I am suggesting that escalating this to an overt intervention, were there a decision among a coalition or a latent coalition, should take account of the 11 factors that I, that I analyzed, lest what is started with the best of intentions proves to be disastrous. Thank you for the question. Um, my, my question really just picks up on what you have just 
Um, the, the reality is, particularly if we focus on, the, as you put it, the fact that the United States is inevitably going to be central to any policy of humanitarian intervention that will be undertaken either by or with the support of the United States in the great majority of cases. Uh, although, of course, we are opening up the possibility for other states with whom we are not uh, in agreement to use the same sort of rules, but leaving that aside. So the United States is going to be the main actor. What I'm wondering is how we reconcile your brand, not, not your brand, but your 11 points for how we... I don't want to be called a brand. <laughs> How we come up with some sort of calculus for intervening. How we reconcile that with the fact, as you just mentioned a moment ago, that we are intervening already. Uh, the CIA is certainly there very actively on the ground. Special forces are certainly there very actively on the ground, whether it's Syria or most of these other cases. So in other words, we have a very strong intervention policy which is already in place. It's not being acknowledged, we're not talking about it, we don't discuss the objectives, we don't discuss exactly who we're supporting. But it's very odd then to have these great qualms about how and at what point we should go public, trying to get some sort of authorization and some sort of coalition. But on the other hand, all of this is happening anyway. Is it just a matter of scale? Absolutely, Philip. Just to ask yourself what would happen if, in fact, a major military force from a, a Western state were to intervene in a physical sense, in a physical and overt sense, what qualitative change would occur as opposed to actions in the shadows? Well, do, do, you doubt that, do you doubt that that would not introduce a qualitative Libya change? Was surely an example in the sense that uh, the United States and its allies were very active within Libya um, without, uh, at two levels. One was the overt intervention after the Security Council authorized a no fly zone, etc. But prior to that, and certainly throughout the period, the United States and its allies were very active on the ground. Um, I'm not sure that it can be just a question of scale, because you can scale up your overt interventions to a fairly significant level. It doesn't always involve sending in that number of US operatives, but it certainly involves the scale of logistical support, the scale of arms that are being sent into the country. And it seems to me that in fact in Syria, I suspect that if we knew the facts, I know no more than you do, uh, that in fact there's probably massive Western intervention going on right now in terms of the arming of the opposition groups, in terms of the provision of intelligence, and in terms of actual steps being taken by um, special forces. So the question is, how does all that fit with such an agonized public debate over whether we should undertake humanitarian intervention? Well, I, I, I thank you for the question. First, the, there, you've cited two cases, one in which there was overt intervention under the, ostensibly under Resolution 1973, something which in my analysis at the time and now in retrospect was entirely justified. I thought that those circumstances augured for a, an effective humanitarian intervention and in fact urged more, even more assertive, more proactive uh, participation. I'm not sure that using the, uh, the same criteria that I would reach the same conclusion in every other situation in which many of the ingredients that one looks for in a humanitarian intervention are tame. Do you understand what I'm saying? The criteria that I'm marshalling here do not inevitably lead to a negative answer, don't proceed. In my view, these criteria would have warranted, and, and I, I applied them as a citizen in my own determination of my position with respect to Libya, would have warranted a an, an humanitarian intervention, and I think it was quite successful. In other situations, in different contexts, I'm not sure the same criteria would lead to that result. 
Yeah, I, I should say, I, I wrote a book on covert action. I don't, in which I concluded that the, the fact that an act is covert does not make it unlawful in international law. It's the substantive act that's being pursued and the circumstances under which it was justified that determine its lawfulness. I think there's a major difference between covert action, which is plausibly deniable, and action which involves the introduction of a major military force. If only the scale and the occupation component which is, I think, a serious part of any long-term humanitarian intervention. And we're talking about interventions that would be longer term. I, I, I submit to you that there is a difference between doing something covertly or doing something with plausible deniability and doing something in, an, in a massive, overt fashion. Obligation, or you just use the language of a warrant? Is it a permission? Do you think it would be a failure of a moral or legal obligation, say, to have not um, intervened in Rwanda or Libya? Or do you think it was a failure of virtue um, that we uh, did or wouldn't have done so in the case of Rwanda? Um, is it an obligation? I've already disclaimed being a moral philosopher. <laughs> um, Would the victims in Rwanda have a claim against you as a citizen of the US for not intervening? Or do you just say, we try the best we can, it would have been better if we had done it? The second. So they have no moral claim against you? Well, a moral claim, again, that's a field that I'm not prepared to talk about. In terms of International law struggles with a number of conflicting policies, which I try to spell out. And they converge in a, they collide in circumstances in which one thinks about a humanitarian intervention. On the one hand, eroding the notion of the autonomy of a state, which is one of the major achievements of modern international law, and the other protecting the human rights of the inhabitants within the states. I'm not sure that I would say that the way that that is resolved in particular circumstances is, reflects on whether it's an obligation or to use Hofeldian language, a power. I, I, I'm not sure that in the way I'm approaching this, I'm not sure that that would advance the discussion. Does this mean American soldiers should have more discretion in refusing to participate in a humanitarian intervention than a war of self-defense? I'm entirely in favor of the individual responsibility of soldiers and citizens and the, their ability to stand up against governmental action in circumstances in which it violates some fundamental postulate where they live. Um, and what degree they should be involved in and how much of the load they should 
I commented in response to a previous question on the fact that in terms of military capacity, there are relatively few actors in, among potential coalitions, latent coalitions for humanitarian intervention that are capable of accomplishing it. And the United States is central to all the efforts. I'm not certain that it, it serves either the United States interest or international interest for the United States to crow about that and to, to insist that it be in the position of manifest leadership in each intervention. I'm concerned primarily with consequence. Libya seems to have had a positive outcome. And Libya, in my view, is a confirmation of the validity of the types of criteria that I'm proposing for assessing in advance whether or not to engage in an intervention. Whether one particular state should view itself as entitled to overt leadership is an issue that I'm not concerned with. Oh, I'm, I'm worried already. <laughs> That's but like I, saying I'm just a country lawyer. <laughs> but I have a question about the ebb and flow of uh, along a spectrum where you uh, presented human rights and sovereignty as the two extremes. And I'm wondering, the, the general question, and then I will open to a few specifics, is could we be entering a period where the spectrum will shift more toward um, viewing sovereignty as a primary determinant. And part of that question is because of things that are happening in the world today, uh, where we see, um, have we entered a period of time where there are a number of factors like um, budget constraints on the military, on the rise of Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's very dangerous for us to assume that there is a linear progression inevitably toward greater and greater human dignity in the international system. It's easily reversible, easily reversible if we're not vigilant about it. And it, I, it's quite possible that the next decade will in fact see a reversal of what the accomplishments that have been achieved in the last 20 years. I prefer not to get into the East China Sea at the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>